Hello, I'm Lawson Brigham. I'm a research professor at the University of Alaska Fairbanks and also Wilson Fellow at the Wilson Center in Washington, DC. Today's session is part of the Geography 2050, uh, a symposium on the future of the world ocean. The session today is focused on the Arctic Ocean and the changes and complexities, policy, research, uh, and multiple issues related to the top of, of the world. Uh, we have four experts with us. Uh, Vera Alexander is executive director of the Eskimo, Whaling, uh, Eskimo Walrus Commission. Uh, she is Yupik, Alaska native from St. Lawrence Island who lives in Nome, Alaska. She was a member of the Arctic Research Commission, a presidential commissioner. We have with us a lawyer uh, and retired diplomat, David Bolton, who uh, served in the State Department before his retirement as director of the Office of Ocean and Polar Affairs. And we have a research scientist, uh, Dmitry Stoletsky from George Washington University. He is an expert on permafrost and climate change at the top of the world. And finally, we have Dr. Mike Schrager, who is director of the Polar Institute at the Wilson Center in Washington. Mike is a former vice chancellor of the University of Alaska Fairbanks. The Arctic is under a great change today. Uh, climate change, globalization of the top of the world, there are multiple, and challenge, multiple challenges for the indigenous people uh, of the Arctic. And of course, we have geopolitical issues across the whole uh, fabric of the place. We hope to cover some of these issues today and all of the changes that impact on people and the environment and the politics of, of the Arctic. The Arctic today is, in fact, one of two of the most peaceful places on Earth. It's the Arctic and the Antarctic, where we have extraordinarily peaceful cooperation among all of the countries of, of the world. At the top of the world, we have eight Arctic states, and they have great cooperation among themselves and among other non-Arctic states around the planet. The, the great changes of climate change at the top of the world is extraordinary, profound, and, and that impacts on everything, every way of life at, at the top of the world. So we'll begin a series of presentations. We'll begin first with our native representative, uh, Vera uh, Metcalf. Vera? Well, um, thank you for the opportunity to speak um, at the American Geographical Society's Fall Symposium, which is my first time. But it is really an honor to share this panel with such a very distinguished uh, gentleman. So, this slide that you see is a background for the Eskimo Walrus Commission, which was, uh, it's a tribally authorized organization representing 19 coastal Alaska Native communities all the way from Utqayavik in the Chukchi waters down to Bristol Bay region. So it's a large, uh, large region, but it was formed in 1978 uh, by the communities to represent the interests with the Department of Interior's Fish and Wildlife Service, which has actually a management responsibility to the Pacific walrus. So we have been an active proponent of the 1994 amendment to the U.S. Uh, Marine Mammal Protection Act, which actually created um, cooperative agreements between agencies and Alaska Native organizations like the Eskimo Walrus Commission. Next slide. First, I, I would like to just say that my comments are my personal reflections and perspective based on what I've learned from my home on St. Lawrence Island, Alaska. From the family, my elders and indigenous knowledge experts, community members, and from my work through the years in cultural and language documentation and natural cultural resource management. So it is really my sincere wish to contribute an Arctic indigenous perspective that is proper, respectful, and responsible to my family, my community, and the cultural values that have been instilled in me. Next slide. <clears throat> 
What I hope to convey is the intimate relationship Arctic Indigenous communities have with their land and waters. I'll begin by saying that I honestly have a difficult time applying the phrase boundary between human habitats and the sea to our lives on St. Lawrence Island in the Bering Strait. Our relationship of the interconnectedness of our island and our waters with ourselves and the gifts they provide doesn't really involve a boundary. Next slide. Like all indigenous people in the Arctic, I believe that my home on St. Lawrence Island and the waters, the land that is involved are the most wondrous, special and sacred place on earth. For thousands of years, my ancestors on this island uh, thrived in this type of environment. Even when there were periodic climate changes and sea ice changes throughout the millennia, the variety and quantity of these natural resources sustained us. So this lifestyle continu continues today. Next slide. Our coastline is intimate, intimately familiar to us. Each point of land or rocks, bay or cove, cliff face or beach, stream or lagoon is named as our traditional camps and old village sites on St. Lawrence Island. Each of these carries a story that continues to build and add to our indigenous knowledge observations, the wind, the currents, or updates and changes to landscape and landmarks for safely traveling in water, by boat in stormy, rough waters, or by snow machine in winter, whiteouts. Many spent much of our summers at family camps, which have been used for generations. When the next generation learned things like where fresh water is found and where greens and berries grow. We also have to learn to respect the sea and to understand its dangers. Next slide. However, for us, this was only part of a relationship with the sea. With the arrival of colder temperatures and north wind, the shore ice moved in. It had the same effect as the increasing blanket of new snow does. It covers and quiets the restless waves and transforms its surface into a relatively stable way to reach seals and fish. It also offers a more direct trail depending on its condition around the island to access other areas much more different, efficiently. As currents and winds open water beyond the shore fast ice like this picture shows, hunters are able to safely bring their boats and gear and leave their transportation, whether dogs back then or snow machines now. Launching and retrieving boats from shore ice is relatively safe and easy compared to rocky gravel beaches. Next slide. Safety and stability of sea ice is very important, even as it begins to break apart and retreat north. It calms the ocean wind-driven waves and provides the perfect platform for finding, harvesting, and safely butchering sail, seals and walrus. The shore ice is the most efficient place to butcher big animals like this a bowhead whale. If it is thick and strong enough to support the big amount of weight. Spring hunting season remains the most critical time to our communities to find some sense of their food security and it greatly depends on the complex interaction between the quality of the sea ice, the wind direction and strength, general weather conditions and the various marine mammal migration timing and location. We are and always have been absolutely dependent on this intimate relationship with our waters and sea ice. This is the strength of our communities, a profound connection and absolute dependency on the gifts given to us from the ocean. Traditionally, there was no boundary. Next slide. However, as many know, changes are happening incredi incredibly fast in the Arctic and in such a fundamental way as our sea ice. The impact on our 
world is overwhelming. These changes are not just an interesting research topic. They represent an unsettling shift in the traditional rhythms of our communities. We have experienced avian, avian cholera and many other unusual events in our waters. And of course, the collapsing Bering Sea, what they call the cold pool, that threatens the existing Arctic marine ecosystem that we depend on. Next slide. This new thawing Arctic presents too many changes for our communities to list here. It is allowing strong southerly storms to erode our beaches, steepen our banks, disrupt our infrastructure with long periods of freezing open spray, and flood our airports. It is melting permafrost that alters our landscape and landmarks, collapses our meat cellars, and causes never-ending problems for the foundations of our buildings and homes. Next slide. And perhaps even more significant are the ways our cultural practices are being impacted. The traditional hunting seasons are dissolving and blending together with hunter safety, becoming an increasing concern. We are traveling further with less sea ice and with what seems like more disruptive weather during our hunting trips. Next slide. Marine mammal hunting is a communal effort within our families out on St. Lawrence Island and clans combining whatever resources and manpower to effectively, properly, and safely send our boats out, often for many, many hours and many miles to harvest whales, walrus, and seals. This involves extensive cultural protocols, such as composition of boat crews, apprenticing the next generation as this young man is, is doing in this picture, and sharing the harvest. In my final slide, next slide. So while our natural world is acting strangely and the traditional rhythms of our lives are unsettled, and although it seems that we are now struggling against our land and waters and are often not in balance with them as before, our communities will continue adapting our lives and relying on our indigenous knowledge to maintain our relationship properly with our world and the gifts it provides. As an accomplished, knowledgeable elder tells me, we are still here in the Arctic doing what we do. So he does not see a boundary with a sea because it is where our food comes from. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Uh, I want to thank the American Geographical Society for inviting me to uh, be with you today. Uh, at the top, Lawson mentioned that the Arctic is a peaceful part of the planet. And one piece of evidence about that is that in the last 10 years alone, there have been five international agreements, agreements, binding agreements, treaties uh, negotiated and signed that relate to the Arctic region, most of which relate to the ocean part of the Arctic. I will focus on only one of them today, perhaps the most unusual one, an agreement about fisheries in the Central Arctic Ocean. Next slide, please. Um, you need a sense of the geography of uh, this part of the planet. Uh, here you see the Central Arctic Ocean. It is rimmed by five countries, uh, Alaska, Canada, Denmark because of Greenland, Norway, and Russia. You'll also see in the middle of this uh, a thin red line. That is the line in the Central Arctic Ocean that is 200 miles from the nearest point of land in all cases. Why is that important? Well, on the outside of this line, each of the five countries have jurisdiction to manage fisheries in their respective zones, exclusive economic zones or fishery zones. But inside the red line, about 2.8 million square kilometers, uh, no country has jurisdiction, and at least in theory, vessels from any country could fish in this area. Next slide, please. When it comes to fisheries, um, the Arctic is not actually a single region. The part of the Central Arctic Ocean that borders the North Atlantic is actually relatively warm and from a fisheries perspective, quite productive. 
There are major fisheries in the North Atlantic heading all the way up into the Barents Sea. And there are international regimes in place to manage those fisheries, the most important of which is known as the Northeast Atlantic Fisheries Commission. And what you see on the left is a map showing various high seas areas, areas beyond jurisdiction, in which this commission manages fisheries that take place there. And at the very top of that map, you'll notice it's cut off. So if you move to the right, you will see that the uh, area of the Northeast Atlantic Fisheries Commission also includes a small piece of the high seas portion of the Central Arctic Ocean. But for the rest of that area, there is no fisheries management agreement in place. Next slide, please. The other side of the Arctic, the, Arctic, the part of the Arctic closest to the Pacific Ocean, is actually quite different when it comes to commercial fisheries. There are no uh, commercial fisheries of any significance north of the Bering Strait, either in the Chukchi or Beaufort Seas. And next slide, please. In that high seas area in the central Arctic Ocean, here you see another, another map showing it, uh, there has never been commercial fishing at any time in recorded human history. And that is because it has been covered by ice year round until now. Next slide, please. Here you'll see um, two depictions of what Vera was describing in part, uh, the warming of the Arctic and the receding sea ice. On the right, you'll see two pictures, one showing the sea ice extent in September of 1984 in the Arctic Ocean, and you'll see a very dramatically different picture in September of 2012, just look how much ice uh, had melted away by then. And on the left, you'll see a chart just showing uh, year by year in September and August, uh, actually this one in August, um, the uh, declining sea ice. And it does go up and down a bit, but you'll see for sure the, um, the declining, uh, declining trend. Next slide, please. In the United States, we made a decision about 10 years ago to prohibit commercial fishing in that part of our exclusive economic zone, north of the Bering Strait, north of the north coast of Alaska, you see the area in question. Why did we make this decision? We simply did not have enough scientific information with which to manage a fishery there properly. And soon after we took that decision, Canada made a similar decision for its area under uh, jurisdiction, its exclusive economic zone to the east of ours in the Beaufort Sea, also essentially prohibiting commercial fishing for the time being. But of course, neither Canada nor Russia nor the, any other of the three states that are in this area have jurisdiction to control fisheries beyond 200 miles, which brings us to the next slide. Here, once again, you see that high seas area, the area beyond 200 miles from any of the coasts. And here in September 2012, you see just how much of it was uncovered by ice. And a portion of that area uncovered by ice is, at least according to our friends at Pew, considered to be at fishable depths, shallow enough water that in theory, commercial fishing could occur on the so-called Chukchi, Cap, and Plateau. And so in the United States, we were starting to get worried that vessels from other countries would come up through the Bering Strait and start fishing at mile 201. So we began a process that took roughly 10 years from beginning to end, first trying to persuade the other four countries in this region of the need to do something about this potential problem. And we ultimately agreed that what was needed was an international agreement that would include other countries whose vessels might be tempted to fish here. Next slide, please. And so um, the negotiation got underway involving those five countries, the ones in the Arctic itself, Central Arctic Ocean, so-called coastal states, and five others, China, Japan, South Korea, Iceland, and the European Union. Um, I was privileged to chair these negotiations. They took place, the actual negotiations on this treaty took place over about two years and wrapped up near the end of 2017. And here are the basic elements. The, uh, there is this new treaty. It applies to that high seas area, the dark shaded area in the middle of Central Arctic Ocean. Uh, 
And it says there shall be no commercial fishing in this area for at least 16 years once the treaty enters into force. More on that later. It does permit very limited and tightly controlled exploratory fishing in that area based on rules that we still have to uh, flesh out. The other major commitment in the agreement is that all 10 will jointly uh, develop and operate a, a program of scientific research and monitoring, trying to figure out how this area is changing, uh, particularly as it may relate to the possibility of fisheries in the future. The 10 parties will make all decisions by consensus. And this treaty, maybe for the first, maybe the first one in history that commits to include Arctic indigenous people in its implementation and to incorporate indigenous knowledge into, um, into the decisions that are made. Next slide, please. So uh, where do things stand now? Well, I mentioned that um, the treaty was signed, the Central Arctic Ocean Fisheries Agreement was signed in uh, October of 2018. All 10 of the signatories must ratify the treaty in order for it to enter into force. And I'm pleased to say that nine of the 10 have done so. The only one that has not completed the ratification process uh, as we sit here today is China. And China has said that it is moving forward with ratification. Uh, it got slowed down because of the coronavirus, but does intend to ratify the treaty. It will enter into force. Um, once it does enter into force, uh, it will be in force for at least 16 years, and it will be automatically extended for five in five-year increments unless any country decides, um, that ob objects to that in which case probably some new negotiation will take place to create a different kind of agreement, one that might manage on a sustainable basis fisheries in this area. Anyway, that's a quick uh, once over lightly of a kind of a new and exciting agreement, one of five binding agreements for the Arctic and the only one that includes countries from outside the region on an equal footing. Thanks very much. Uh, it is a great pleasure to be in this panel and thank you for our invitation. It's also my first time at AGS. And uh, I think my major goal here is to balance a little bit the opportunities, which a lot have to do with opening of northern sea routes, declining sea ice extent with some of the challenges that may come with climate change on land. And a lot of those challenges have to do with presence of permafrost, which holds a lot of infrastructure, a lot of various, various settlements and a lot of problems associated with further development of those regions. So if you go to the next slide, I would like to show the basic permafrost map that shows that permafrost is actually a very common phenomenon. It is, in fact, underlies almost a quarter on northern hemisphere, terrestrial hemisphere, and also we see that map shows some of the subsea permafrost. That's a permafrost that is result of much colder climatic conditions when during glacial maximum, large areas of Arctic shelves were exposed to very cold atmospheric temperatures and they were freezing to a great depth. So I was moving to interglacial period and over the last 10,000 years, those area was mostly under the water, but that permafrost is remains to some extent, and that permafrost still holds a lot of organic material that was accumulated over long periods of time. What is interesting about this map is that permafrost is dynamic and it is changes. Some areas are almost entirely occupied by permafrost shown here in brown, those are areas of continuous permafrost. And lighter color shows areas of so-called discontinuous and sporadic permafrost, those are areas which partially occupied. So the interesting thing about permafrost is that in many ways we think about it as permanent frost, which is completely incorrect. It is perennial, just like flowers that you buy at a store can be annuals and perennials. And that really 
changes our understanding of entire system because it is in fact very dynamic system it is not permanent it's perennial and therefore it reflects changes in climate conditions and changes in development next slide please so changing climatic conditions warming arctic which happens at a twice high rate than elsewhere on a globe declining sea ice extent declining snow cover extent are of course very important considerations but when we talk about changes on land there is a very strong change in permafrost which we call degradation that permafrost degradation is a global phenomenon but especially important and especially fast moving process in arctic permafrost degradation is in fact very challenging for global community because a lot of carbon that has been stored for hundreds of thousands of years being released and entering biochemical cycles which further may promote warming of arctic and globally and also and probably more important that over short term there are a lot of impacts that we already see and will continue to see probably to a greater extent by the mid of the centuries and those are local and regional impacts which include changes to ecosystems habitats infrastructure development and subsystem economies some of those pictures i showed here include challenges with associated road infrastructure pipelines challenges that Vera already mentioned with ensuring food security of indigenous communities which rely largely on meat sellers dug and permafrost those are problems associated with large infrastructure projects uh, you probably know about new emerging things such as this crater that is shown on the bottom of the slide those gates gas emission craters start to appear in 2013 in coastal areas of Siberia and of course the top picture on the right is oil tanks that just collapsed this spring due to especially warm climate conditions and permafrost in Narilsk releasing 20,000 tons of diesel fuel into local streams next slide please so when we think about this connection between land and sea of course we think about cost and as well mentioned there is very sort of fusion of those processes it is not abrupt transition in many cases but what is problematic is that a lot of costs are composed by ice rich permafrost sediments and due to considerable decline in sea ice extent lengthening of open water and increase wave activities and storminess those costs are disappearing very fast so those are some of the pictures from utkiakvik and from eastern siberia from western siberia that show very substantial one of the highest in fact rates of coastal erosion which are shown on this map in the center of the image and of course those processes not only change the natural conditions input large amounts of organic into the sea but also change challenges infrastructure and subsistence of those who live along the coast next slide over a long time over a long term we can even think about other geopolitical implications so this is a map from Yakutia, Sakai Republic from end of 19th century, which shows some of the islands in Novosibirian archipelago that are not there anymore. They were eroded and washed away. In fact, some of the estimates, some recent estimates of rates of coastal erosion suggest that Russian Federation losing a land comparable to a small European country such as Liechtenstein on an annual basis. Next slide. This map shows one of the examples of how we can think about what's going to happen by the mid-century. So this is a map sort of 
for the mid-range scenario, sort of some of the implementation of Paris Accord. And you see that in green are the areas that would remain occupied by permafrost and those areas that in blue, those are the areas which would experience significant permafrost degradation. You may think that those are the areas that have pretty substantial development. And if you look at the next slide, you can see how existing settlements and existing infrastructure may be challenged by those changes. One of the major hazards associated with permafrost degradation is melting of ground ice, resulting in changes to topography, resulting in changes of accessibility of northern communities, because it is had detrimental impacts on road and pipeline infrastructure. And another very important consideration is change in temperature, because ability of Arctic foundations to support structures largely depends on how cold is permafrost. Warmer permafrost is able to support less and less structural weight leading in damages. So from this map, you can see that some of the areas which shown in red are hot spots which expected to see one of the highest rates of permafrost degradation. And a lot of those hot spots associated with areas of pretty substantial economic development. Next slide, please. So I don't want you to, <laughs> I don't want to leave you with uh, just a lot of kind of negative impacts of climate change that we can see by the middle of the century. There are, of course, ways to mitigate those risks and to minimize them. And of course, a lot of it has to do with future cooperation and knowledge co-production between scientists, indigenous communities, and local stakeholders. There is very little data that we have currently monitoring data, which enables us to find those problems, right? So if we don't know there is a problem, we can address it. So that requires establishment of monitoring in natural conditions and also, and more importantly, probably in settlements and industrial facilities in order to help to prevent catastrophes such as Naril's oil spill, which happened this spring. There is very little known about subsea permafrost, and this is a big storage of methane that has a potential to significantly influence climate change. This data that already there, it's very hard to get. There are a lot of companies, there are a lot of stakeholders that collect this data and they don't share it. So we need to figure out how to share and maximize the data that already there. We critically need to have better projections, both climatic and socioeconomic scenarios targeting permafrost domain in the Arctic. Without that, we will not be able to find those hotspots. We will not be able to fully address those hazards and associated costs of development for 2050. Thank you. Well, I want to also thank uh, my co colleagues here on the panel for outlining many important issues and doing it so eloquently and in Vera's uh, case uh, so palpably uh, so viscerally teasing out not just the issues that play in the, the Arctic but how they impact the people of the Arctic um, so thank you all and also thank you to the American Geographical Society as a geographer I have a special attachment to this particular organization and, and audience um, but also as a geographer you know I'm, I'm familiar with the fact that we need to study uh, we describe, we research, we think about our relationship to landscapes, and there's probably no place on Earth that's shifting so much in terms of its landscape other than the Arctic. Uh, there are shifting contours to our Arctic, in environmentally, politically, economically, socially, culturally, the security dimensions of the Arctic, and sometimes it's hard to describe uh, all of that at play at one time especially when you think about the issues that both Dave Bolton and Dima covered, uh, how dynamic this region is, uh, not just environmentally, but in all facets of life. Next slide, please. So I've been thinking about the Arctic, and it's a very big neighborhood, but a very small community. With four million people above the Arctic Circle, 
uh, when you go to meetings and you talk about the Arctic or you're with your colleagues, they're usually small groups of individuals who've been working on Arctic issues for a very long time. But it's good to take this circumpolar perspective of the Arctic and think about all of the implications at play. And it's no longer an emerging Arctic. We hear about this often in the press, you know, the emerging Arctic. I'd argue that the Arctic has emerged. It is as every bit of piece of the geopolitical landscape, the cultural landscape, on and on than any other region on the planet. In fact, it's become more and more important and more consequential over the last decade, and I would argue over the last four to five years, as we see such dramatic change uh, that Dave has pointed out in the Arctic Ocean. Next slide, please. So I have thought about how we communicate the Arctic. How do we tease out the issues at play in the Arctic? How do we better communicate the Arctic? Why, why should anyone care about the, the Arctic? It's a very big issue. It's kind of like climate change. How do you describe to people who are worried about day-to-day -day life why they should care about all of the ripples and implications of climate change? Well, then why should anyone care about the Arctic? It's hard to describe this. It's hard to communicate it. So I came up with this conceptual framework called Navigating the Arctic's Seven Seas. Any nation state, any community, any region thinking about the future Arctic, in my opinion, must be thinking about how they best navigate what I consider to be the seven large drivers, themes, uh, issues at play in the Arctic. I think my colleagues here have touched on almost all of them. So as geographers, as we're thinking about the future Arctic, I would argue we should think about these seven C's. Next slide, please. The first C, as my colleagues have noted, is climate, the primary driver in the Arctic, right? The climate is warming, perhaps heating, more than twice as fast, almost three times as fast as anywhere else on the planet. As Dave noted, the Arctic sea ice extent in September is its second all-time lowest. So Arctic climate change is real, it is rapid, and it is relentless, and it is reshaping our Arctic. So in thinking about how we conceptualize the Arctic, climate is the major driver. Next slide, please. Commodities. We hear a lot about oil and gas development. Right? The Arctic holds over 22% or so of oil, untapped oil and gas. Think about strategic minerals. Uh, think about uh, your cell phones and what goes into our modern day um, habits and, and livelihoods. Commodities, uh, whether they're oil and gas, or strategic or rare earth minerals and fisheries more and more. Commodities are a major driver of what's happening in the Arctic. It's driving the narrative, but it's also driving politics. And our communities of the North and elsewhere, like colleagues in Asia, rely on the fisheries in the Arctic. That's why Dave's uh, uh, negotiated agreement is so important, not just to Arctic communities, but to global communities. Next slide, please. Related to commodities or commerce. As Lawson Brigham will often tell you, uh, maybe there's probably no other place on the planet aside from Greenland, perhaps, that if you're looking for a region that's emblematic of the New North, the Northern Sea Route would be one that I would argue is emblematic of the New North. Significant oil and gas de development, uh, direct foreign investment from China, uh, ships, LNG ships being built in the shipyards of South Korea, moving Russian gas to Asian markets. Uh, with Chinese investments. I mean, that to me, that's a globalized Arctic. So commerce through the shipping lanes of the Northern Sea Route down to the Bering Strait or over to Europe. It's not the panacea I've heard and read about in the press. It's not going to totally change the commerce and shipping activities of the globe. But nevertheless, it's an important component and one certainly that the Russian Federation has invested a lot in economically and politically. So commerce is another driver that we would need to consider when we're thinking about the seven unique drivers of the Arctic. Next slide, please. Connectivity. I'm not just talking about telecommunications, but that is incredibly important. Many months ago, the Wilson Center, along with our colleagues at the U.S. Arctic Research Commission and the Navy War College, held a two-day program on COVID impacts in the Arctic. And almost every panel for two days noted the need for better reliable, redundant, affordable internet connectivity in the North. There aren't digital divides in the Arctic. There are digital abysses in the Arctic. And, but that's not just internet. Drivers like ports 
and roads and rails and basic connectivity to support research, communities, education, on and on. To me, connectivity is a major driver as we navigate this new Arctic. Next slide, please. Of course, a lot of this comes down to our communities right, of different types, all different communities in the North, some very modern, some not so, all feeling the pressure of the other drivers, climate, the uh, look, looking for commodities, trying to figure out how they can leverage a new Arctic to develop economically in their regions. Uh, these are also communities under stress. Uh, many villages in Alaska, maybe three dozen or so, at some point will have to relocate because of the coastal erosion that Dima talked about and other factors. But there's also a, another factor here at play in the smaller villages and, and regions throughout the Arctic, and that is that communities don't just want to sustain themselves. They would like to thrive. I know I, I don't want to sustain. I want to thrive. And so this is a discussion that's happening in these communities, not just about hanging on. It's about moving forward. So these are very dynamic discussions happening at a local level, regional level, uh, nation level, and, and, and beyond internationally. So our communities, it's an incredibly complex issue, one in which the seven C's all seem to come together on. Next slide, please. Cooperation. I think we've all touched on the amount of cooperation in the Arctic. Um, it is still, quote unquote, a zone of relative peace. There is a hard line narrative out in the press and elsewhere to be expected. Uh, there are some real um, competition issues, which I'll talk about in a moment, but we should celebrate, reinforce, uh, and advance the cooperation that happens from the Arctic Council perspective to the IMO, to the Arctic Coast Guard Forum. You know, there's a lot of discussion happening in the North. It's the tyranny of distance. There's also commonality of landscape and purpose and, and common, common foe in terms of environment. So cooperation happens on a big scale in the Arctic for such a small community. We should not miss that. And in fact, between the United States and the Russian Federation, I would argue that the Arctic and the International Space Station are the two places where we actually talk almost daily, if not weekly. Uh, on issues that we both have in common. So we should celebrate that cooperation. I'd argue we should reinforce that cooperation going forward. And finally, the last slide in navigating uh, at least Mike Sprague's Arctic Seven Seas is competition. You know, we, we should be wide-eyed on this, on this matter, uh, but, in my, but we should also be measured. So in my opinion, uh, we do have competition in the Arctic, whether it's economic or militarily, uh, governance structures, of course, China has uh, interests in the Arctic. Um, sometimes that narrative publicly is inflated, in my opinion. Sometimes it is not. But also other non-Arctic states have stake in the Arctic. They have equity. They have interest in the Arctic. So there are competitions throughout the Arctic. I think collectively we need to measure those, uh, uh, look for areas that we can deconflict, understand better what nations are doing in the Arctic, so that they all can be addressed in a, in a manner where we don't come into a conflict. Just recently, the Russian Federation held a uh, exercise in the Bering Sea, and we had Alaska Pollock fishermen in the same region. Uh, miscommunication could have gone, uh, could have impacted that um, encounter in a way that no one would have wanted, both legally fishing, legally fishing uh, within, their, within their legal rights and the Russian Federation operating within their legal rights in international waters. But this, this conflict issue could become from a miscommunication. So for me, uh, how we shape, how we live in, how we define, how we understand, how we put in perspective the future Arctic, to me, I use these lenses of the seven seas. At least it helps to conceptualize and to put into digestible buckets the different things at play in the Arctic. I will leave it right there, Lawson, and turn it back to you. Thank you. Well, thank you, everyone, for those uh, great presentations. Uh, I think all of them show the complexity uh, of the Arctic today, and 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 point out all of the the uh, challenges that that we have. I thought Mike's uh, framework for. Uh, handling this complexity is is right on the mark uh, multiple issues 
all intertwined. I, I, Vera, I enjoyed your comment and your observation that uh, that the human dimension and humans in the Arctic really don't have those kinds of boundaries that we're talking about, physical or political. It's a seamless uh, relationship and linkage between humans and, and in this case, the sea for, for uh, indigenous people. Could could you comment a little bit more about that? Would would you mind commenting? Sure. Well, we are so I think intimately tied in with our the land and the the waters in in so many ways because it allows us to um, you know we know so much about what we have to harvest our the marine mammals. You know that our hunters are able to travel long distances and get back safely. That, that's what matters to us. And they often travel on land to find other resources that um, will feed our families and friends and neighbors. But I think it's this intimate uh, connection, interconnectedness that we have with our environment. It's, it's what we call isla in our Yupik language. It's because we have, we know this environment so well, and we hope that it remains that way for for a long time. So I, I hope that answers your your question. Oh yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, excellent uh, perspectives on it. Uh, very helpful. Uh, let me let me switch to the resource question. Mike talked about it, uh, and, and and Dave did, and as well as Dima. There are other resources, of course. We, we talked about fisheries and oil and gas, but, but the top of the world, the Arctic, is an extraordinary uh, storehouse of things like uh, iron ore and zinc ore. Um, in Alaska, we have the largest zinc mine in the world, and, and that zinc ore is carried to markets throughout the Pacific and uh, British Columbia around to, down to uh, East Asia. In the Canadian Arctic is the largest, one of the largest storehouses of high-grade iron ore, and that can be carried to European markets uh, uh, nearly year-round. So, so, so there is a focus in the press uh, on energy, particularly oil and gas. But in the longer term, through the century, these other resources uh, have great value to the world. And there is one wild card that has been looked at, and it's actually fresh water. Any of the panelists have any comments about the potential for these resources and their development? Mike, Mike anything to add to uh, your uh, your uh, C on uh, commerce? <laughs> And develop. Yeah, Lawson, I th think you're you're right. I mean, the the, the opportunities in the north for uh, further development of resources that are uh, more and more critical to daily life. I mean, you know, the, the tech phase is fueled by rare earth and strategic minerals, um, and I think well, obviously, commodity prices will drive a lot of the exploration in the north. Um, and as you know, as the world looks to shift away from oil, more to natural gas, and then maybe more to renewables, we might be seeing, you know, a shift in what happens in the north to the commodities you noted, versus the traditional, quote unquote, traditional oil, gas, coal, perhaps. Um, I, you know, I will uh, defer to Dave on on many of these things, including, of course, the fisheries. But uh, I, I also do think that there is potential for regional use this in the right way, exploitation of fresh water, uh, Greenland in particular, where there's already interest from outside uh, companies, corporations, and other interests in uh, ways in which they can effectively, sustainably export fresh water from Greenland. Uh, th this is not off the table and elsewhere. So I think you're right. I think you're saying the portfolio expand, but again, commodity prices driving it and shipping from from any place in the north to any place south is quite expensive. Um. Yeah, th thank you, Mike. I think 
r related to this uh, topic is how the indigenous people of the Arctic, how will they share in this resource development? Of course, it's tied to every individual Arctic state uh, and how the mechanisms uh, work in returning some of that development to the indigenous people. So it's a, an issue maybe not to be explored fully here, but it's a central issue uh, for all of the Arctic states. Uh, let, let me ask Dima about the trends that we see in climate change. Uh, wh what do you think the Arctic will look like in 2050 or beyond? What, what, what's your sense of these changes? Well, I think that uh, we're pretty aware of the magnitude and direction of those changes. I think pretty much all models agree that it's going to be significantly warmer. And if you think about ball parking, it's probably three and a half in high Arctic, maybe up to four and a half, five degrees. And those are very substantial changes. Those are changes as you move through entire state of Alaska from, you know, Prudhoe Bay down to Anchorage, you know, geographically. So those changes uh, are profound and uh, unprecedented because we have pretty substantial records from ice cores, right? We have a lot of proxy data that allows us to reconstruct past environments and compare it to the present. And clearly we don't see changes like that anywhere on the records that we are able to get, whether it's from observations or from proxies. Uh, so it is, you know, concerning. So Arctic will be warmer uh, with this. We will see, like with any change, some opportunities for probably, you know, development of transportation, tourism, accessibility of commodities. But with those opportunities comes a lot of responsibilities and challenges, right? So even development of coastal infrastructure will require a lot of attention to those disappearing coasts. Right? So there are, you know, a lot of pitfalls in a warmer Arctic, right? So generally, I think change is not a bad thing. The fast change, the change that happening at the rate that you cannot prepare for that's that's concerning yeah i think you're you're quite right the uh mitigation efforts won't be able to change the dramatic changes we have at the top of the world being twice the elevation of temperatures you know global measures will will be able to make some inroads but perhaps not change dramatically the trends that we we see in the arctic today uh, let me switch to the geopolitical world and ask Ambassador Bolton to tell us a little bit about the Arctic Council. I think people have heard about it. There's a, some misinformation about how it works, but clearly the Arctic Council is at the center of cooperation in, in the Arctic. Uh, Dave, any, any thoughts about the Council and its role? Uh, thanks, Lawson. Yeah, I do. Um, so for those who may not know very much about the Council, it was created in 1996. Its members are the eight countries of the Arctic region, US, Canada, Russia, and the five Nordic countries, Norway, Sweden, Finland, Denmark, and Iceland. It has a, a unique feature in that it includes as permanent participants, uh, six groups of Arctic indigenous peoples uh, from all parts of the circumpolar North. They participate in the Arctic Council in their own name and right, and not as part of national delegations. The Arctic Council focuses primarily on environmental protection matters and uh, sustainable development, but it actually has a broader mandate and has served as a place where countries um, of the Arctic can negotiate agreements, for example, on search and rescue and oil pollution, scientific cooperation. And it has really started to shape the political agenda of, of the North. What began as a kind of sleepy organization in the mid 90s has evolved to um, the, the preeminent body dealing with circumpolar issues uh, in the North. Every two years, the uh, eight foreign ministers, including the US Secretary of State, meet and they um, typically you know, chart uh, a path forward for the Arctic for the coming two years. The Arctic Council has its problems, uh, lack of funding, and right now um, 
inability to meet in person, but I actually think it has potential to, be, to do even more in the future, um, even though it doesn't, uh, it doesn't uh, have what uh, lawyers would call legal personality. It is a flexible and a cooperative body. I think it's a, it's a real benefit. If it didn't exist, we would have to create it. Thank you. Yeah, great. Uh, a question for everyone. Do you see this region as an area of tension and conflict in the future or more as a peaceful region? It's a difficult and complex question to answer, but uh, maybe we could have a short discussion. A anyone want to jump in? Well, I wouldn't mind starting, but I bet everybody has some idea. Um, the Arctic has been a very peaceful and cooperative region since the end of the Cold War. Um, but it is true that of, of late, the last couple of years in particular, new tensions have arisen. There's talk about great power competition coming into the Arctic, some of which is real, some of which is overhyped. Um, uh, military to military cooperation uh, between Russia and the other countries ended uh, with the invasion of Crimea and other uh, frictions between the countries. And yet we still have a great deal of com in common in the Arctic, and we need to continue to find ways to work together as we have in the past. Whether we'll be able to do so uh, remains to be seen. Those are my two cents. Oh, yeah. Thank you. And, and anyone else want to weigh in? This is Vera. Um, yes. Thank you. Um, the Inuit Circumpolar Council during the Oktavik 2018 declaration, um, one of the things that they mentioned was the Arctic BF. Uh, free, you know, free, re peaceful region. But here in our region, Bering Strait, it's an international strait. Across is Russia, but we have what on St. Lawrence Island, we have clans and relatives and friends across the, you know, our neighbors. So I would hope that it remains a peaceful, free environment for, you know, because of our close connection to our neighbors to in Russia. Yeah, I would add to that, uh, Vera, thank you, uh, that uh, cooperation, particularly between the United States and Russia on practical maritime issues has been quite quite strong over many decades and continues to this day. Uh, the two countries uh, cooperate on important maritime issues at the International Maritime Organization. And then at the local regional uh, um, areas, adjoining areas in the Bering Sea, they cooperate almost every day on an operational level. So I, I think there are certain different levels of uh, cooperation and security issues that uh, are sight unseen, but hugely important to, to the Arctic. Uh, Mike or Dima, you want to weigh in? Yeah, I'll second everything that you know was said above. I think it's uh, has been since Cold War and continues to be a very uh, great example of cooperation between countries and other actors, including various indigenous bodies. And I applaud Arctic Council for that. I think it's a great model that should be considered in other locations. Uh, my only concern is a possible role of some external actors that are not part, that are not sitting at the table, that are not having those discussions, whether it is permanent or observer states of the Arctic Council. So there is a lot of instability. So moving towards, if you look 2050, you know, there may be some, you know, I, I think it's important to consider broadly other actors and not just those who are directly involved in the Arctic as well. Oh yeah, sure. It's certainly a good point. It's that all of the non-Arctic states, everyone in the world other than the eight Arctic states, that, that want a piece of the action, piece, piece of the future, likely an economic piece uh, and, and access to the resources uh, that, that are controlled very tightly by each of the Arctic states in very different ways. And each of the Arctic states has different rules and regulations, domestic law, uh, to, uh, you know, to take these resources and use them to their advantage. So very, very interesting dynamic. Mike, are you still with us? Would you like to weigh in on this tension versus uh, 
uh, peaceful place we have in the future, the Arctic? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm, I would you know, second all the comments made here. I think that's why it's so important for the cooperation uh, to not only be maintained, but also enhanced uh, as, as others have pointed out. Uh, also know that these, these regions are very different. You know, what's happening militarily in, in uh, the North Atlantic, in the Barents is, is different. Is there's differences in terms of dynamics on the Bering Sea, uh, Chukutka, Beaufort, pick, pick your favorite sea or ocean. Uh, th these are very different things and it's a projection of each country's sort of national stance, what each country is, uh, what their motivations are, what their interests are, what their equities are. So I have used, uh, you know, many of you have known this, I've used this game analogy, which is not pejorative in nature, but if you're taking a look at what the actors are doing in the North vis-a-vis -vis the competition side, the, the potential for conflict, um, in a lot of ways, it's extension of their national interests, right? Russia, so much of their GDP and their exports come from the Arctic. And so, of course, they're going to protect their interests along the Northern Sea Route uh, in, in a manner that we might perceive as being offensive. They might say it's defensive and protecting their interests. Uh, there are overflights. There are a lot of activities in the Baltic related to the, also connected to the North Atlantic and the Barents. Um, China, you know, has a, has a very different thing. In, in a lot of ways, Russia is playing the game survivor. I mean, a, a declining uh, demographic, uh, an economy that's closed. I mean, it's, it deals with the rest of the world, of course, but a closed economy with some significant challenges. China plays the game go. Long-term geopolitics, patience, economic influence. Uh, and the United States, again, not pejorative in my game analogy, plays Twister. We we we're all over the we're all over the map, literally and figuratively, for a lot of good reasons, and maybe uh, some would argue not so good reasons. But we have our own equities here, where we're looking out the South China Sea to the Baltics to the Mediterranean, and so you know it's an extension of who we are. The Arctic now is part of that, um, and that's why many of us have cautioned cautioned on the narrative of conflict. These are manageable through communications, often com and and a lot of in interpretations. Uh, through communication. So I would balance these. What gets the press, of course, is the conflict side, which I totally understand. I think everyone should be vigilant, diligent, eyes wide open. For China, the Arctic is part of a, it's a small part of a bigger game. For Russia, it's part of their DNA. And for the United States, it's part of our national DNA. Thank you, Mike. I think on that note, we'll, we'll close the session. I will thank uh, all of the panelists for Great presentations and a great dialogue. And I wish all uh, the participants a good day. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. Very much.